So today I'm welcoming back our first ever repeat speaker to Enter Live. So Dr. Sam Green is going to be talking to us about something quite different from what he talked to us about last time. So Sam works for Wildfish and he's going to be talking to us about the Smart Rivers initiative. So really looking forward to this and it, it should be a really nice follow on from the Riverfly monitoring um, Enter Live that we had earlier this year. So Sam, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me again. Yeah, slightly different from camouflage and rock pools, talking about uh, invertebrates and rivers these days. Um, so yeah, I'm Sam Green. I'm the freshwater ecologist at Wild Fish Conservation, and I primarily support the Smart Rivers program. So Wild Fish Conservation, if you don't already know, is a conservation charity and a lobbying charity and our overarching aim is to reverse the decline of freshwater fish populations and to improve their habitats um, and our working portfolio reflects this with a range of ongoing projects including uh, reducing the impacts of water abstraction and off the table which is our project up in salmon um, uh, up in scotland sorry working to end open net salmon farming and importantly we focus on water quality uh, and this includes our recent high court action to hold the environment agency and regulators to account for failing to deal with the current sewage crisis. And that includes our ongoing citizen science scheme, Smart Rivers, where we monitor freshwater and vertical communities to get a signpost of river health. Uh, as a charity, we're, ev we're evidence led and we use the law to address the causes, not the symptoms of the challenges facing our freshwater habitats. And a keystone to all of this is the fact that we're completely unaligned and so we accept no government money so we're wild fish first not politics so why fresh water why does it matter um well freshwater habitats are some of the most biodiverse on earth fresh water covers one percent of the planet's surface but it's home to almost a quarter of all vertebrate species and over half of the world's um fish species and additionally for it for us, due to the quirks of time and geology, uh, England is home to 85% of the world's chalk streams, which are these incredibly um, biodiverse and crystal clear, or they should be, freshwater habitats. And so, yeah, it's pretty much pretty much an endemic habitat, and we have a global responsibility to protect them. Um, it's worth highlighting that freshwater biodiversity is declining at a faster rate than any other ecosystem. So. Uh, populations of freshwater species have dropped by up to 81% globally between the 1970s and 2012, and that was a rate more than double the decline in terrestrial and marine systems. Um, on top of this, so a third of freshwater fish species are at risk of extinction, and within this, freshwater migratory fish are most at risk. Uh, globally, populations have declined by 76%, um, and that's actually 93% in Europe. And, and that means including and within that is 75 percent of sa salmon have disappeared from the uk and um salmon are the kind of flagship species of, of of wild fish stop talking about vertebrates i hear you cry this is an ento live webinar um and you're completely correct so globally the majority of freshwater animals are invertebrates uh, and insects are estimated to make about 60 percent of this diversity and freshwater insects or invertebrates in general, have an essential role in river ecosystem functioning. And so in addition to being a vital food source in the food web, uh, many perform key ecological processes and shape the environment around them. And so because of this, changes in invertebrate diversity and abundance will alter the natural balance and ecological resilience of river systems. And this has huge implications for other species further up the trophic levels. So there's some really interesting research that came out this year, uh, looking at the changes in freshwater invertebrates in, in, in our rivers, uh, found that the recovery of uh, European freshwater invertebrate biodiversity has come to a halt. And so this study was conducted between, you know, including data between 1968 and 2020. And uh, the study found that overall there has been an increase to the invertebrate richness and abundance. So that's the number of species and how many of them. Um, however, closely looking at the data, the authors found that these um, improvements and increases primarily occurred in the 90s and early 2000s, and since then these, this recovery seems to have plateaued. And so what they think is happening is that the early recoveries we've seen, which is great, freshwater systems can bounce back, 
but these are linked to really big infrastructure and legislation improvements in the early 90s and that the data seems to indicate that in the modern day threats um our infrastructure system is just not uh, not keeping up keeping up and we really need a to up our game to cope with the modern modern challenges like increasing populations and increasingly complex chemical um, issues. So our lives and society are dependent on water. And so naturally we have a huge impact on these on these ecosystems. And the rivers carry the, a chemical and physical fingerprint of the local catchments. And so we like to think of this as a call it a death by a million cuts. So everything we're doing on land is affecting the water. And this could be a variety of, of issues that are being faced. So things like over abstraction from our waterways for domestic, industrial or ag agricultural use, or uh, diffuse pollution from agrochemicals leached from overexploited farmland, or accidental or purposeful waste disposal as sewage is released into uh, watercourses over the country with its cocktail of effluent and chemicals or indeed for the physical modifications we're making to our rivers. So these might be flood defences, um, increasing urban encroachment and barriers created by weirs and dams, um, or invasive species who, whose geographical range we've, we've aided spreading. And on top of all this is also the backdrop of climate, climate change. So we have warmer waters, which has a really serious um, impacts on invertebrate life history or extreme floods and, and droughts. Which means it's easy to understand how these will affect uh, rivers in, in general. So, in the face of all of this, um, it's clear we really need to be keeping a close eye on on our rivers and their health. And um, due to a series of, uh, of budget cuts over the decades, the Environment Agency is is just not able to get boots on the ground anymore to keep up the level of monitoring that we need. Um, and so this needs to be monitoring done by, by, for example, the Environment Agency and not by self-interested parties like, like the water companies, because that's going to be key to preventing any kind of environment. environment. Um, and so when the monitoring declines, as we're seeing, uh, that means there's no evidence. So mon monitoring underpins the inspection and enforcement needed to cut pollution. Without this monitoring, problems disappear. And, and we now lack a coherent picture of the state of freshwater environments in the UK. And this is massively concerning, um, as in, I'm sure many of you know, as in 2019, only 14% of rivers were considered in, in good ecological health. And every river had been, had, was uh, negatively impacted by chemicals. So English rivers, in, the proportion of English rivers in good health is, is actually one of the worst in, in Europe. Um, so I do apologise for the gloom and doom and spoiling your lunchtime. So we'll get back to talking about bugs to try and cheer ourselves up a little bit. So when you take a water sample, you get a snapshot of what's in the water column at that time. And so you'd have to be in the right place at the right time to catch a pollution incident. But the invertebrate communities that live in our rivers are always there, or they should be, and also depending obviously on their life, life cycles. And so changes within invertebrate communities can give us really important intelligence into the struggles under the surface. Um, because invertebrate species are, are really particular about the water they need, water quality they need to thrive. Um, and they all have different sensitivities to different pollution, to different pollutants. Um, so the species that are present and absent and in what numbers can give us really, really valuable information. And one group of, um, freshwater invertebrates that this is this really focuses on are what we call the river flies and so that's mayflies caddisflies and stoneflies and as as large groups they're generally thought of as more uh pollution sensitive and so more of these species in your water generally means better water quality um so go back to the to the mid 90s and the kind of the idea of citizen science invertebrate monitoring was born out of a concern by people like anglers and river keepers who were witnessing their rivers really declining before their eyes and felt that nothing was being um, said about that. So yeah, this, this kind of virtual monitoring as we know it was born on the, in the mid nineties on the banks of the River Test, which is one of our flagship chalk streams. Um, 
And they, these these courses were conducted at Leckford by Dr. Cyril Bennett, who's pictured in the top corner of the of this slide, and also I don't know people like Warren Gilchrist and Peter Peter Francis, who came up with the Anglers Monitoring Initiative. And then the picture on the bottom left is in around 2002, um, the Anglers Monitoring Initiative linked up with the Natural History Museum, and then following that in around 2004, uh, Natural History Museum Conference, the Riverfly Partnership was born um, to continue this le family level monitoring of our freshwater invertebrates to um, identify gross pollution events. And then in 2014, in a meeting chaired by Salmon and Trout Conservation, which was Wild Fish's name before they came Wild Fish. Um, and this was with various, various stakeholders. A need was identified for species level monitoring rather than family level monitoring to get a true assessment of the state of, of freshwater habitats. And from this stemmed a series of collaborative courses and the, the Riverfly census, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then following this uh, came the birth of Smart Rivers, which holds to this original agreement in the 2014 meeting that we really need species level analysis to get to grips with freshwater biodiversity. So just to say that we still work um, closely with Dr. Cyril Bennett and he provides us with these incredible macro images which we use to help identify um, the invertebrates in our surveys and uh, Cyril is actually my uncle so I, I was taught to fly fish by Cyril at a, at a early age and I've been growing up with nothing but mayflies I've got bugs in the blood um, and so it's great to be able to carry on carry on his work and so a little bit about why we need species level this is just the kind of the taxonomic levels and when you get to the species level you get the fine detail so for example within the British mayflies which as I mentioned earlier is a group traditionally thought of as pollution sensitive um, within this group, you will have varying levels of sensitivity to different um, pollutants and water conditions just as a basis, basis of ecology. And so it's really important to get down to the fine detail because the species that you're having in an area um, could be telling you if they're really, really sensitive to certain things or if they're a bit more tolerant. So it just gets that extra fine tuning of the information. Um, right. So the Riverfly Census was where we, the Royal We, ran uh, fully professional vertebrate surveys across 12 rivers in England uh, between 2015 and 2017 um, to look at changes in the invertebrate community. And then that's and then we re-ran re the uh, Royal Fly Census in 2021 to see what changed. And so this is species level monitoring in spring and autumn. And from this, you gener it, it generates biometric scores so that the invertebrate community is indicating what stresses the river is facing. And so this could be chemical, frost, sediment, organic enrichment, or low flow. And of course, because we do species level analysis and, and look at abundance, we've got really good biodiversity records from this, from this work. Um, and so the reports, which are gonna be shared in the chat and are all available on our, on our website, um, had some kind of worrying, worrying findings. So for example, in the chalk streams, our first round of surveys found that there was a loss in up to 44% of mayfly species uh, compared to the data from 1998. And within the surveys as well, 46 of the autumn surveys failed the proposed water framework directive standard for chemicals. And on top of this, 58% of rivers surveyed indicated concerning pressures from sediment at at least three of their sampled sites. Right, and then, so we went back in, in 2021 and we're still finding some really uh, concerning concerning results. So in 2021, we have much lower mean diversity of these sensitive riverfly species than our, the 2015 to 2017 census. And this time, 47% uh, of sites in autumn exhibited greater chemical stress. So the chemical pressure on, our, on the rivers we monitored seemed to be getting worse over this time. And so, I'd, yeah, I'd really recommend going onto our website and downloading these uh, reports if you're interested, because um, they're really quite detailed. And so, on this, we wanted to continue this kind of level of monitoring through citizen science, because obviously, at a time when the Environment Agency's funding is being slashed and their monitoring is going down, being able to mobilize uh, citizen scientists to really monitor the rivers where they care for them is a really powerful thing, and we can fill this gap. Um, 
and so the river and this is alongside the riverfly partnership who do a their monthly um bank side family level identification which can check for gross pollution events smart rivers is a twice a year detailed analysis species level high resolution and it gives us records in, bio, in biodiversity and chronic water pressures that the, the invertebrate communities are facing. And those is species level where possible, because there are some groups like the true flies, which can be very hard to get past family, um, but particularly for the, the river fly species, and as many of you try to go to species level wherever you can with the keys we have. So what is Smart Rivers? Well, if you, if you join up with Smart Rivers is generally hosted by a, a hub, so this could be a Rivers Trust or a, a community group that's interest, interested in protecting a stretch of their own waters. Um, and what, what happens is we come out and we do benchmark surveys. So in spring and autumn, professional entomologists will come out uh, and they will and we'll work collectively to choose which sites you want to, to survey. And then the benchmark surveyors will go out and get to this benchmark for you. So we'll know what kind of species you've got and in what numbers, and we use this as your baseline data set. And then the citizen science side comes in where we have our training days, after which the hubs take over responsibility of monitoring the river in spring and autumn. Um, and so this training day consists of, uh, is a two day course. And on the first day, you learn how to kick sample, um, the, the three minute standard kick sample followed by a one minute hand search to get an assessment of all the different substrates in, in an area of river that you're surveying. And then we take these, we teach you how to preserve the samples and take these samples back to the lab and begin the sorting process. And this is a this is a kind of broad, broad sort into the into the key groups that we're looking for, because on day two is when we start to get down to the nitty gritty uh, with the species level. And so species level identification is hard, and we're not we're not taking trying to say it's not. But what we do is by doing these. Uh, benchmark surveys, we produce an expected species list. So what that means is that we're not trying to teach you every single freshwater invertebrate in the country. We teach you how to identify the freshwater invertebrates that you are likely to find in your surveys. And inevitably, when new species pop up, we have methods of adding them into your expected species list. And so on day two of the course, we work off this expected species list and we teach you how to identify these individual bugs. Um, and, and you, the citizen scientists, become experts on your river. And this is done with the, with the help of the, these incredible macro image keys that I spoke about earlier. And the other alternative option we have is some groups um, have some funding and, they, uh, and uh, it takes a lot of time to do IDing. So we also facilitate sample, sample and send. So the citizen scientists go out and collect their um, samples, and then we will send them off to a professional entomologist to get identified. And we work with each hub on a case by case basis. But as an overview, the Smart Rivers program works from going from sample to score. So we go out, you collect your invertebrate sample in spring and autumn, you pick them out, collect them, and then you from that we get that data, we generate the um tolerantly the biometric indicators from the tolerance tables, and we can look at the, the species richness and abundance. And then we get this uh, water quality stress scores. And this is just an example of one of the incredible um, identification keys you use, really high quality macro image with some key ID features. And this is um, the green drape bump, arguably our most famous mayfly, just to highlight it. So, Smart Rivers is, has monitored about 80 rivers to date. Last year we monitored uh, 55, and so that are translated to in 153 sample uh, sites were sampled in spring and 149 in autumn. And over the year, we identified 268 invertebrate species and you know nearly 350,000 in individuals. And this uh, graph in the bottom left just breaks down where into broader smart rivers groups where these what the numbers of these invertebrates were. And it's worth noting that in the miscellaneous taxa, 93% of those individuals were gamorous, which is a freshwater shrimp, um, which we do expect to find in large numbers, particularly in the chalk streams. Um, and from our 2022 data, the, the greatest stress in our spring surveys was from sediment, and the greatest stress from um, in our autumn samples was, was from chemical and chemical pressures. 
and then we get to look at kind of these, a general overview of, of water quality from our from our from our annual data and this is where we can come kind of we plot all our data this is the combined combined stress of phosphate um sediment and chemical pressure where uh, lower values in indicate uh, increasing stresses indicated by the invertebrate community and so we can have a broad overview of of, of the, the stresses our waters are facing and we can also start to look at uh, things like uh, species richness and abundance particularly for these sensitive river fly species um, and within these sites that because within each of these rivers there's various sites so inevitably you do get good and bad sites and often that's the aim of some of our of our hubs so you'd have a for example you could have a a, a site upstream and downstream of water treatment works and try and monitor what impact that's having on your stretch of river. And we'll get back onto that a bit later when we talk about Windermere. Um, and then from this kind of annual picture, we can we can look at um, individual cases and work with our hubs to try and do what we can to take this data forward and use this data to good effect. So here we've got um, data from Goldbourne and Millbrook. So Goldbourne Brook is it's 200 meters downstream of sewage works and it, the, the surrounding area is, is, is intensively agricultural. Um, and and on, on top of that, the river, the river has historically been straightened and suffers quite a lot of, um, from bank erosion as a result. Um, and at Millbrook, the land use is, is largely intensive uh, dairy upstream. Um, although the land directly above the site is a combination of uh, a local nature reserve and permanent sheep pasture and horse paddocks. Um, and so continuing the background of those sites, uh, and it's not surprising the invertebrate community um, are showing quite considerable stresses, and that this is particularly true for chemical sediment and nutrient pollution compared to other uh, Welsh hubs that we currently cover. And um, from this, you know, chemical impact is somewhat the most concerning. Um, and our chemical, our chemical stress metric doesn't tell you the type of chemical pollution at play. It uh, it just indicates that there's a chemical pressure in this bit of river. And given the background to Goldbourne and Millbrook, um, it's likely a combination of, of agriculture and wastewater inputs. And then a uh, another case study is uh, Ray, Ray Bridge in Ray Brook. And this was the worst performing site uh, in the UK for, for a range of metrics. Um, and when we talk to our to our volunteer hub uh, who who work work the site, we we can get a bit more information. This site gets dredged periodically by the internal drainage board, and it, and its banks are about ten foot high, so it's very sluggish at this site, and water's water really backs up during flood flood for, for, um, flows, and and the land use around the this site is is agricultural with a combination of arable and uh, sheep farming, and you know we can see in. In our autumn data, the invertebrate community um, showed notable stress from fine sediment, organic enrichment, and flow in comparison to other other English sites. Um, and that's hardly surprising given the background to the to the with the ten foot banks um, and low flow, because without natural flow, rivers are less able to move the sediments and dilute uh, polluting inputs. So yeah, that was just a, a quick overview of our twenty twenty two data, um, and a link you guys are going to get in the chat uh, will point you to our 2022 report and all of this, the, the, the whole report and the data summary is, is available there. You'd like to learn a bit more. Um, so yeah, now I'm gonna give you a bit of an overview about a couple of our hubs and just look at how Smart Rivers data can be actively used. You know, we don't wanna collect data for data's sake. We wanna collect this data through citizen science to empower local communities, protect their areas of water. Um, and so I'm sure you, many of you know Lake Windermere is our largest natural lake and it's really important economically to the area but also ecologically it's, it's home to a huge range of species and the unfortunately its ecological health is in in a bit of a state with um, untreated and treated sewage arguably being the greatest threat uh, to the health of the lake and since 2020, United Utilities assets have discharged untreated sewage into the catchment for over 18,000 hours, which is a remarkable um, number. And so we work closely with Matt Staniak, who runs the Save, who runs Save Windermere. Um, and you might seen, have seen some of his amazing work trying to hold United Utilities to account for what they're doing to Windermere. Um, 
So yeah, so this year Matt set up a uh, Smart River Super Hub with us as he was concerned about the lack of independent monitoring being conducted downstream of these United Utility assets. Uh, and so it's worth noting that most, in this case, most of our sites are designed around that. So we're, we're, we're picking sites upstream and downstream of assets to try and assess the impact they're having on invertebrate communities. And we monitor the, in the in the super hub, we, we uh, monitor the Rode, the Brave, Kunzi Beck, Wilfin Beck, and Fall Woodbeck. And I'll just spotlight um, a couple of those now. So the River Brave, um, its water pumping station just, just discharges into the Great Langdale Beck, which is at the top of the map here, uh, where one and two are on the on the diagram. And then this flows into Elter Water site of special scientific interest. And then into the River Brave below. Um, and the asset the Elter Water Pumping Station has spilled untreated sewage for more than 1,600 hours since 2020, and it's, it's less than a kilometre away from the site of special scientific interest. I'm really interested in monitoring these sites. Um, and what our data showed is that, particularly for siltation and chemical pressure, um, we're seeing much higher pressure affecting the sites downstream. And this, this is reflected in the invertebrate communities as well, because um, in particular, so this is an average over the two seasons, spring and autumn. Um, there was an 88% reduction in river fly abundance between the top and the bottom site. So that's your caddis flies, stone flies, and mayflies again. Um, and so, yeah, the siltation and chemical graphs are at the top. You can see on the on the left, there's a, a colored band. Um, red is bad, good is good. Uh, red is bad, green is good. Um, and then the lower graphs are about the invertebrate communities. And we get to get have get quite a bit of detail here, where in the bottom left, looking at the spring graph, you can see what we found is that higher proportions of the invertebrates are pollution tolerant species downstream. So at, at site three, um, you see the, the big blue uh, rectangle. That's primarily sixty percent of the sample being quite sediment tolerant uh, clams. And at site four at least 71% of these invertebrates are, are, are considered pollution tolerant. And this inclu includes true flies, mites, and worms. Um, with those latter two are included in the, in the miscellaneous text group. Um, yeah, so the, the next site I wanted to highlight was, was Kunzibek, um, which although it's designated as a site of special scientific interest, um, sections of the Kunzi uh, appear uninhabitable, particularly downstream of near Sori, uh, wastewater treatment works where sewage fungus coats the riverbed um, and what we've learned is that there's no there's actually there's actually no limit on phosphorus input into Kunzi from this wastewater treatment works and that permit was issued in 2018 and on top of this the emergency overflow at one of their assets is is currently unmonitored um, and so we got bought Kunzi came to our attention in 2022 where there was a mass fish kill um, and following the pollution incident, Wild Fish and Save Wind have been working closely together to try and identify the polluter. Uh, and the Environment Agency attributed this to this fish kill to an algae bloom. Um, but our information request uh, uncovered a series of errors and in inadequacies in the EA's handling of the investigation. Um, but I won't go too much into that, but I can encourage you to watch uh, Panorama, the water pollution cover up at eight o'clock tonight on BBC One. Um, for a, a big spotlight on the Windermere um, work that's been going on. And certainly our invertebrate data uh, paints a bit of a, wor a worrying picture. We've got um, communities indicating high phosphorus and siltation stress, particularly at site three, which was the site of that mass fish death. Uh, and we've seen yeah, up a 79% decline in uh, sensitive river fly abundance um, below the wastewater treatment works compared with directly above. Uh, another hub I wanted to show is our, our Watercress and Winterbournes hub, um, and they they work in the headwaters of the Test and Itchen, which are two of our and the other two of the flagship chalk streams. And so we've got seven seasons of data with these guys covering nine sites. And what this allows, and this is uh, an overview of the river test. And so here we've got organic uh, chemical phosphate and siltation pressure scores for each of the sites. Each of the sites is shown in a, as a colored shape, whereas the black dot uh, with error bars is the average for that year. And on the on the left, we've got spring and on the right, we've got autumn. And so this, I just wanted to include this graph just to demonstrate that with the Smart Rivers program, 
when we get a few years of data, we can start to really look at what's going on. And you can start to spot out if, for example, particular sites are, over the years are always performing worse for something like siltation. We can then work with the hub to figure out how um, to spotlight the sites to help target their remedial work and, and support the work they're doing to improve the improve for itself. Um, and if we're still within the same uh, hub, if we spotlight into the River Antum, uh, where there are two sites being monitored, we can really start to look in detail what's going on here. And there's been since 2018, and all this is the autumn data. Um, there has been a there's been a decline with a partial recovery of of kind of the chemical stress um, and one of the sites showing much greater fo uh, phosphate pressure. And interestingly, this is where we can start to look at the site side by side and show that everything's not equal. And so in terms of the sensitive river fly species, we can see at the at their KFC site, there's quite, been quite a positive trajectory in terms of um, river fly abundance since 2018, but this, this hasn't been seen at the second site at, at Stanner. So we really like to work with hubs to try and understand what's going on in these instances and how we can help remedy it. Um, and so this graph is just a repeat of the, um, is, is still the Anton, and this is the entire invertebrate community, not just the uh, sensitive river flies. But within the kind of color keys at the bottom here, you can see that KFC, their site on the left, um, you've got increasing numbers of mayflies and caddisflies over the years, and you, we're not seeing um, these trends so much at Stanner. And, and again, here, the, the big blue is gamma, like I was mentioning earlier, which is a common common invertebrate we find in these um, samples. But also a big a big chunk of the 2022 sample at um, at Stanner is true flies. And things like true flies and gamma can be invertebrates that are quite quick to capitalize on areas of habitat, which have um, had some kind of impact. So you, you sometimes after an impact, you see larger numbers of these, of these groups. Um, and then just the final, uh, spotlight of one of our hubs is on the River Avon, another one of our flagship uh, chalk streams, and this is with the Wiltshire Fisheries Association. Um, and so we've got five plus years of data covering 30 sites with these guys, and it's an amazing, amazing effort um, from angling groups. Um, so the data we're collecting at, the, at, the, at this hub is helping us to challenge statements um, when we think they're incorrect. We've got data to back up our perspective on the, the health that we see the River Raven in decline and we see invertebrate communities really struggling. Um, um, recently, uh, the Environment Agency made a statement about the River Raven not being able to, not deteriorating over the last five years um, in the presence of some of the, mem the members of our hubs, which obviously didn't go down very well. And so they came to us, like, can we challenge this statement? And so we looked through their Smart Rivers data um, to try and look at what's going on. And I mean, this is the the autumn invertebrate data uh, since 2019. And uh, this is of 11 sites that were spotlighted. And you can see that you know, invertebrate communities are clearly in decline over the years. So something's clearly going on. And so this has led to a uh, earlier this, no, last week, I had a meeting with um, representatives of Wild Fish, Natural England, the Environment Agency, the Rivers Trusts and the, and the Angling Clubs. And we got to have a roundtable sit down to discuss what's going on, and you know, in, in the scheme of what the what the environment agency had meant when they said it hadn't deteriorated in the last five years, they were talking about in relation to the water framework directive, um, which we can argue about here, there, and everywhere about its suitability for various things. But this meeting was incredibly encouraging with the environment agency um, uh, acknowledging that there's clearly clearly issues going on on the river, and, and we need to we need to act to. To mitigate these these um, threats, and having this really powerful species level smart rivers data just gives you, you know, ammo in the quiver when you're going into these meetings. To we have evidence to show that things are not all well on the riverbank. Um, and one of the one of the key uh, pressures that jumped out was uh, the chemical pressure, particularly in autumn, and you can see a really significant decline over uh, since 2019. And we've processed a number of our 2022 autumn, sorry, our 2023 autumn samples now, and this, this trend is continuing. Um, and so, yeah, our data is indicating um, chemical pressure on the avens increasing. And like I said earlier, this chemical pressure score, it doesn't tell us what the chemicals are. It just says that chemicals are impacting the environment. And so from this, 
the Fisheries Association are working and ourselves and the Environment Agency and uh, university colleagues at Portsmouth, they're doing this great project with chem catchers, which are uh, devices you leave in the river um, to actually monitor what these chemicals are. So it's kind of a step by step approach that so we can identify. It's clearly a chemical blue, uh, issue going on here. Can we identify what these chemicals are? How do we go about reducing this chemical impact on our invertebrates? Um, yeah, uh, our, our, our overall ambition is that all rivers should be smart rivers um, and that rivers give us so much and we should be giving them the best healthcare possible. And there's so many really passionate groups around the country um, fighting to uh, protect their, their stretches of water and, and wild fish and smart rivers are, are all about that and supporting that with our citizen science program. And um, and yeah, to just reiterate the key the key point, which is this this species level um, high resolution data um, has credibility and empowers local people to fight for better protection of of, of, of these stretches of water. Um, and it's worth uh, highlighting that one of the one things that I well I'm biased of course, but one of the things I really like about Smart Rivers is our data is open access, so we have a cartographer website, um, and if you'd like to access the data all you have to do is email us at smart rivers at wild fish and um, to get a log on and then all of our data from all of the years of surveying spring autumn biometric breakdowns invertebrate bi uh, biodiversity breakdowns is all available at the click of your mouse um, and you can see over the country we've got kind of from tip to tip we've got we've got monitoring going on um, but we're always looking to expand the smart rivers network so if you'd like to get involved, please do get in touch and we can either put you in touch with uh, citizen science hubs that are already active in your area. Or if you're interested in setting up um, your own hub, particularly, you know, there, there are clearly blanks on the map, so to speak. So anyone interested in setting up their own hub uh, to protect their area of water, we're, we're really interested in, in supporting. Um, I'll just close quickly with, the, you know, the other strands of, of what wild fish is up to, uh, trying to protect our rivers. Um, so we, you know, we're really trying to reduce the impact on you know, fighting the water company's reliance on on the stressed rivers for water supply. Um, so abstraction is, is a huge threat, particularly for our for our chalk streams. Um, using the law on sewage to make sure that the the these these laws are enforced now, not in the distant future when everything's already gone down the down the potty. Um, and also preventing the harm caused by open net salmon farming in Scotland. So just very briefly, some of our some of our successes recently in, the, in terms of legal action on on sewage, um, we had a judicial review challenge uh, brought to the High Court earlier by Wild Fish, and it clarified a 1994 law on on sewage treatment, which is the Urban Wastewater Treatment Regulations Act of 1994, which restricts the circumstances in which untreated sewage can be released into into rivers right via the storm overflows. Um, so that law requires water companies to use the best techniques not involving excessive costs to prevent untreated sewage from being released unless there is exceptional in exceptional weather um and i think judging if anyone's watched the news in recent in recent weeks and months you know that maybe exceptional weather isn't always being held it isn't always the way things are being done um and so our case confirmed that this the sewage treatment infrastructure needed to comply with the law and importantly, that uh, this must be funded by the water companies, uh, not by customers through their water bills. Um, and yeah, so in, and in parallel to this, uh, the judicial review uh, in 2022, we made a formal complaint to the Office for Environmental Protection, which led to the OEP announcing its first ever investigation of into the regulation of combined sewer overflows, which is great. Um, and this this investigation has already already identified possible failures to comply with environmental law by DEFRA, the Environment Agency, and Ofwat. So, you know, that, and that's a quote from, from the investigation uh, below that. And so that's terrifying that all, all, all three of the public authorities aren't, uh, you know, failing to comply with the law. Um, so we believe it's really clear um, that Ofwat has a duty to act to enforce this, this law against the water companies, even though it's failed to do so over the dec decades, and it must do that urgently. And the Environment Agency also has a duty to secure compliance. Um, and if if the regulators don't, um, you know, wild fish is um, is is always will actively considered further legal proceedings to uh, to force compliance with the legal duties and to enforce the law on sewage and protect our rivers. Um, 
And then finally, just to spotlight the, the off the table campaign. So this is to try and uh, reduce open net salmon farming in Scotland, um, where the majority of salmon uh, served in the UK comes from. And you know, these, these um, there's been there's been various um, documentaries and works recently uh, documenting this. But these these intensively farmed submerged cages are, are you know they they cause horrendous environmental and welfare issues as well as sustainability. Um, so one of our campaigns is to try and take farm salmon off the menu. Um, and in a shameless, uh, shameless charity punt, um, I just want to promote our, our salmon free Christmas appeal, which is currently live. Um, so please do visit it, uh, continue supporting us. Um, and if you just, you can uh, scan that QR code and I'll leave that up on the screen while I'm answering any questions. So yeah, thank you very much. I will do my best with questions.